welcome to yet another episode of Contact Lost, the Polish, now half Polish, half American podcast about Warhammer 40k, competitive Warhammer 40k. Uh, and we focus for the last seven episodes, I think, we've been focusing on the World Team Championships, so or the WTC for short. Uh, I'm sure you know what this is. I'm sure you've also caught that in one of the episodes if you've been a regular listener that we will be there to provide like the studio with nathan with joker who sadly is not with us today uh and we are going to be doing coverage hopefully interviews and many 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 other cool things so bear with us because we will continue these series pretty much until the the um the event itself and then hopefully we can either meet each other or see each other or hear each other while we are there. So I'm your host, Tweek, as usual, or Tomek. And with me, I have my, I can now say, trusty co-host, Nathan from StatCheck. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, Nathan. And uh, <laughs> since this series is uh, is about like the top 10 from the previous year, uh, so we came to the point where it's time to talk about team Sweden. And to talk about Team Sweden, we have Team Sweden's captain, Jonathan Slay Johnson. Yes, I didn't mess it up. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> Hello. Um, glad to be on. Happy to hear that. So to go move away from this awkward introduction and to kill the awkward silence, I guess we can just simply jump in into questions and uh, see where this takes us. So Jonathan, um, I think I will start with the question about last year. Last year, you came in top 10, which is no small feat. You took seventh place. Is this or was yeah. this a place that your team was satisfied with or was it sort of below your ambition? How would you rate your performance from last year? Um, I think we were satisfied with it. We had a couple of close games, like we had a very close game against Australia. Well, not close. We were very close to drawing the game versus Australia. So I think we felt that there was definitely a possibility of doing even better. But in the end, I would say we we were quite happy with the results because we also, like, we missed a few armies on the, on the get-up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think, I, w I would say that in the end we were happy with the result. Yeah. Okay. All right. So were there any lessons learned, any conclusions? We ask everyone about this, no matter if they came first or 10th, uh, this question always appears because I think it's always useful to, to our listeners to learn from other people's lessons learned. Yeah. So w w what conclusions did you draw from that? Like, or, you know, what improvements could be done? Was it the the, the, the matrix, the pairings themselves, or the actual choice of armies? Or were there mistakes during the game that, you know, shouldn't be repeated? Wh which one of those was it? Or was it like a mix of those? I feel, I mean, there are always mistakes there. There's gonna be a matrix mistakes. Uh, no country will do a perfect matrix. It's it's the amount you differ by, or if you accidentally think, for example, that Crafters wins or, or Harleys, that would be an insane take. Uh, so, yeah, no, I think our biggest mistake, if I go down to it, is the fact that we did not, we missed on Necrons. We did not bring Necrons. Uh, so I think our biggest mistake was in maybe the army selection, and I would attribute that to the fact that... Um, the meta changed just a few weeks before WDC into Nachmund. Mm -hmm. And that caught you so, by surprise. So definitely army selection was our biggest mistake last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what, what, steps are, what steps are you taking for this year's WTC to kind of address that? Are you guys spending more time in army selection? Or have you just, because the meta is such an in such a shifty kind of state at early 10th and with the newest balance patch, how are you kind of taking steps to address that this year? I do think we have a much wider, what do we call it, playtest group this year with, the, with many more people involved in the team, not just the, the eight people. So we have a wider testing pool. And honestly, we also have more time this year. 
at least it feels like there's more time. I I, <laughs> I think that Nachman gave us less time than than this tenth change did. And sure, this tenth change is bigger, but figuring out what armies are good is uh, not that hard this year, I think. So, are you using any anything... at least not the top? Are you using yeah. anything specific to actually establish what those armies are, or do you follow, <clears throat> sorry, like the the, the meta checks, <clears throat> stat check perhaps, or are you basing your choices, your decisions on your own experience? I mean, I think anyone does both, right? Uh, there's been a lot of talk, like in our Discord lately, about trusting your own testing, and and I think. At one point, you have to trust your own testing, but also if your testing varies widely from, say, tournament results, then maybe you could be doing something wrong. Um, so I think a, a wide world view and your own testing is the way you you get there in them. That makes sense. When we're talking about kind of, you said you have a much wider like testing group this year. Um, how? How big is your testing group? And are those all people who could potentially be on the playing team? Or do you have like a playing team and then a testing team and then like non-playing people be beyond that? Or how is the Swedish team kind of set up? Well, uh, I think, yeah, so basically it's a, it's a wider team from say the the, the top of the Swedish uh, like competitive meta. It's all uh, done through Discord. Uh, it's a Discord community where people have access to the, uh, to the like, what do you call it? in team consideration part. Mm -hmm. And then, so it's, it's the team and the like extended team or like people that want to play in the, in the team in the future that has potential or like, so, uh, so that would be the extended team. And then there's also uh, non-playing people involved in that as well. Okay. okay. What the, what the, what do your preparations look like? I mean, we've spoken to many teams already, so we've heard. I don't want to say we've heard it all because that's definitely not the <laughs> thing. But I think we get the the rough idea of what certain teams do and what teams prefer not to do. Uh, and the common theme is a lot of TTS. Uh, the common theme is for the majority going to international events. Uh, so, hmm. is it also common for the Swedish players to travel abroad to play and gain experience, observe what other teams do? And then, second part of the question, do you play TTS as well, or any TTS leagues, or something like that? Um, I'll start at the, at the second part, because mm -hmm. uh, it, it's more interesting. We did a lot of TTS scrims in ninth at the end of ninth. Uh, Versus other nations, and uh, we also joined some TTS team leagues, uh, like the the Copenhammer team leagues. Oh right. Uh, okay. I think it was Copenhammer. We played in two times or something like that. With mm -hmm. a bit of a like um, pickup team between team members and and potential team members. Um, yeah, so we were quite on it at the end of night with with TTS versus other nations at the. In 10th now, our TTS has been mostly internal testing, uh, like one-on-one -on -one with people observing to get a better view of what's actually happening in the game. Um, yeah. And then as for the international, I think Sweden is, we're not that good at having an international presence on the tournament scene, mm -hmm. uh, in either singles or teams, I would say. so. I think that is an area of improvement. Um, we have last two years, we have gone to the, this, the least secret, secret team tournament in the world in, in, uh, in the UK. <laughs> the, the home nation. Uh, this year we only, yeah. yeah. Uh, last year, this year we could only send half a team because the invite came very late, but the year before we were a full Swedish team. Mm -hmm. Okay. So today, uh, Actually, is the day when the I think it's called Pira Teams Cup or, or like Pira Teams Championships or something like that. There is a yeah. Polish secret tournament for teams that Scotland, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, two teams from Poland and God knows who else have been playing. It is you can see it on Tourney Keeper. I can already 
reveal, I guess, that, guess what? Poland won, uh, oh, but, no. Poland A, uh, but <laughs> you won't see the lists in Tourney Keeper because <laughs> they are all hidden. Like, everyone is yeah. very secretive. I mean, obviously, the teams over there saw what their opponents brought uh, and saw what their opponents potentially could bring to uh, to the to the main event, but uh, you won't see the list on Tourney Keeper. What do you think about endeavors like this one, and would you like to be part of it next year, for example? Um... Yeah, being part of it is always like, yeah, I, I could definitely get a team together to do it. So, yeah, for sure. Um, I think they're good. I think secrecy in the, like my old captain, when you'd say, internet has ruined 40k and has also ruined the need for secrecy. Um, the, the home nations I've been a part of uh, and the one this year, there were no lists in that that I would say broke the meta or the Americans couldn't have guessed were there. Um, it might be a bit different now, but also I know that there is a list document for this team tournament, and some people that shouldn't have it already have it. So I, ah, oh I think boy. secrecy is very, very hard in the age of the internet. Um, I love this. And also, it's say, the that's... <laughs> yeah. Just some spy versus spy, you know, with some national teams just kind of trying to figure out what everybody else is bringing. I guess kind of on that note yeah. where we're talking about kind of inter like relationships between teams and these secret tournaments. Um, this isn't a hard question, I suppose, but Sweden, like historically, has been pretty close to the United States. Is this like mm -hmm. is this still a relationship that Sweden and the United States have? Are you guys still doing scrimmages and things together? Or has Sweden kind of been branching out to form relationships with more teams other than the United States? Because you did attend, like you said, the last two home nations as well. I would just say yes to both. We did. The, America was the team we scrimmed a lot more, most in ninth, three times, I think. Mm -hmm. And then we did scrims with other teams as well. So, I, I mean, yeah, we're, we're keeping that up and we're also branching out. So, um I like that. That's also a secretive answer to the question. <laughs> and not meant to be, really. I mean, I, it, it's just uh, <laughs> the truth. <laughs> so, so tell me this, because uh, I really like what you said, although I would like you to expand on it a little bit. You said that internet has ruined the secrecy of 40k. <laughs> How? <laughs> Why? What do you mean? Well, for, this is not my opinion. This is my old captain's opinion. But but just that with information so readily available everywhere, first of all, it's made everyone better. And I do know, I, I agree that the, the skill of 40k is no longer coming up with the best list. Uh, like, I don't think the skill of 40k is, is figuring out uh, this list that no one else has figured out because if you have a thought or of an interaction with an army then someone else will have already thought of it mm -hmm. almost always but does that mean uh, that this was part of the previous events for example where you know the discords podcasts and all, all the like internet communities were not that uh spread out that part of the yeah wtc sure. or etc was yeah okay so the least secret secrecy was part of the whole fun i guess uh, i mean that but depends again where you laid uh where, where, where does your fun come from is it from writing mm -hmm. lists or playing the game perfectly or learning from the game but i mean for sure when i played back in third edition there was not there was it was much harder to find a good list because you couldn't just go on the internet and, and find one mm -hmm. right but would you also say that, uh, mm, let's say, the skill of the team uh, in the past boiled down a lot to how they built their lists? I guess this is something that, that Typhus said in um, Enter the Matrix in one of the episodes. I think uh, it, it was pretty much in line with what you're saying right now. Uh, the teams would come to the event better or less equipped, but equipped with their own ideas. And sometimes the list would completely catch the opponents by surprise. So is that also your, <coughs> is, is, and is that gone now? Um, it's not completely gone. Uh, also, just to be fair, I have only played one WTC before this one. But mm -hmm. like when I uh, am told the stories of, of Sweden's greatest loss, loss versus say Russia, mm -hmm. uh, where 
no one understood Russia's list. Like our matrix in that pairing was completely green. And mm-hmm. as they tell it, they got a total of like five points away from that game. Wow. Because they wow. did not understand any of Russia's list. They got mm-hmm. full green pairings and they lost the worst that they've ever lost. So I don't think that could ever happen in today's 40k. Okay. Yeah. But that sense. doesn't mean it's not like because like last year Australia still brought some weird lists that really did well for them. But mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. not to the point where you look at a list and you go, I have no idea how that works. Okay. Do you think that there are just some tools as well that people use a lot now that are just kind of, you said that, well, I guess kind of attack the question a little bit differently. Since list building's kind of not the stage at which we're talking about for like true skill development for players, are we talking about more now that we have TTS and things like that, that we can practice and like the overall skill base of a 40k player has improved because of those like tools that are available? Yeah, for sure. Like the the average 40k player today is probably miles better than they were even five years ago. And five years ago to five years before that, it's also just not recognizable in the in the level you could get to. I guess we can go back to a team Sweden question since we kind of went off on a tangent about how the internet's both yeah, awesome and terrible. It's, no, it's great. It, tangents are amazing, but it's wonderful to also realize like, wait, we're supposed to be here for a reason, right? Uh, so yeah, how does yeah. team Sweden select its team members? You mentioned like a little bit about a league and then you mentioned kind of some rankings. Does Sweden also have like a league that yeah. they use? Okay. Uh, it's not a league. We have an internal ranking system that is based on the last one and a half years and the top six tournament placings during that year in Sweden. Mm-hmm. So that ranks the players. And uh, I think it is the 1st of September every year, the top three from this ranking is picked for the team. Oh, they're asked if they want to participate in a team. And that mm-hmm. is the three first players. These three players are then tasked with selecting a captain, either from within themselves or from someone else in the in the rankings. And then that captain basically picks the rest of the team. But I mean, you could just pick it all yourself, but mostly it's a team effort, right? So, and then there are some other restrictions, like I think everyone but two has to be picked from the top ten of the rankings, and then you have two like wild cards from outside the rankings if you want. So how did you go about picking the team this year? Since you are the captain. So in theory, you picked the team, right? Yeah. Uh, I was uh, one of the top three last year, so I was selected from there. So I, uh, yeah. But uh, I mean, it. it is very seldom that someone comes up with a pick for the team and, uh, and someone goes against it. It is usually pretty obvious what, what, what players are in the top. But I suppose you... it's also. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, what was the the defining factor for players getting on the team apart from like being in the top ten? Because uh, I know that in, for example, in, in Poland, uh, not every member of Team Poland is happy about the fact that the league players get chosen onto the or, or get automatic places on the national team. It's just because, for example, they've been playing throughout the entire year with a single faction. And then if something happened to that faction, be it <coughs> a balanced data slate or an FAQ or something else, that player might not be as good with another faction. But that's just one example. So did you go for players who mm-hmm. are the, the best in skill or players who are faction specialists or the contrary, players who can you know they are quite good and they could pretty much do anything <coughs> there is, like any army, and do well with it. What's the thinking process there? Well, I had, um, when I was selected like captain, I, actually this started last OBTC when we were walking home on the on the last day of the event. I, I basically said that I will not pick any players that play only one faction. Okay. So that meant having a talk to some players that you need to have more faction if you want to be picked next year. Uh, I also placed pretty big, like, if you don't play TTS, it will be much harder for you to be on the team. Like, the, the level of not playing TTS, you need to be, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and then yeah so so you need to be able to play a few factions you need to play regularly obviously you need to play tts and also i place a lot of value in if you are not on the team that year that you're willing to help out like you're willing to test the matchups you're willing to input in the discussion you're willing to come to like the training camps and like the wider testing circle uh, and honestly if you want say you want to play on team sweden next year i would expect you to come to wc this year and be a coach or be a water boy or something like if you're not willing to travel this year i, I don't really know if you would be in the running for next year if i'm the captain though. but yeah mm-hmm so it sounds like dedication is kind yeah. of like the key yeah. trait that we're looking at. Okay. Yeah. So sure. we've talked a little bit about that. And then the advice also you'd give to potentials is traveling to the WTC. Is there other advice before yeah. traveling that they should like steps they should take before traveling to the WTC? Should they get into a discord? Is there, if there's a WTC team specific discord or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, we have a specific Discord where you everyone can join, and then there is obviously a backstage of that Discord for the more people that are maybe trying out for the team, and we feel are are in the right skill group to be part of the team. And then, uh, yeah, so start by joining that and being part of the discussions. I would say because that also gives us a wider view if you are going to be uh, like team material. I have to say. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. So who who are the members of the team this year? Um, first talk about maybe the play the players and then the non-playing like coaches and things like that. Okay, so I'm gonna okay. Whew. Uh yeah, so I am the captain, <laughs> but I'm also the playing captain. Uh, <laughs> then we have Daniel Hesselberg, the the last year's captain, who's also a player this year, Olaf mm-hmm. Svensson, um, Carl Abrahamson. Uh, Jesper Anander, Axel Rydén, uh, Andreas Holm. I'm forgetting one, aren't I? <laughs> Everybody always gets but to the I, last one. They always do. <laughs> You're, you've got one left. I got one left. Oh, no. <laughs> so you're going to owe somebody a beer if this takes longer than, like, 30 seconds. <laughs> no pressure. Our coaches are Sebastian and Sami, <laughs> and the last player <laughs> is... Oh, Johan Norman. Yeah, that, there, there we go. There you go. So you was also the last person to be selected. So yeah. <laughs> but but Johan, if you're listening to this, uh, he owes you a beer. <laughs> Agreed. I had to close um, so, Discord because I was worried about it lagging, so I didn't have the list in front of me. <laughs> excuses, <laughs> excuses. Yeah. I think, yeah. Don't worry. You're still, I think, not the slowest team to get all eight off off the cuff. So you're doing great. No. Um, so who do you have a set group of people who are responsible for your matrix, or is it like one person who's responsible for doing your pairings? Uh, we have like a group of three or four that should be doing the pairings, and then the other people will be like standby if we need them. Like if we need to ask them about a specific matchup on a specific table. But we like to keep it a bit smaller when we're at the table because eight people having input usually just messes it up. Mm-hmm. You mean, yeah, eight eight cooks in the kitchen at the same time cannot make yeah. a dish, right? Yeah. Also, someone uh, has to build the tables. <laughs> <laughs> True that. So uh, we know who the team is, uh, but I would like to, to, to find out uh, some, some something more about the Swedish community as a whole. I mean, first of all, does the team yeah. does the team has like a strong community backing? Uh, do people care? Will you have some sort of support, you know, support uh, in your Discord or somewhere? Do you think that there will be a bunch of people rooting for you at the event? Uh, interesting to follow, you know, the streams, the, the, the studio that we will be doing and stuff like that. Or is the group that is going actually the, the only people that are interested in the WTC? No, no, I think that uh, Sweden has a strong competitive community, and I think most of them are interested in, in how we perform at the WCC. Okay. So, obviously smaller than some nations because we are a small nation, but yeah, no, I think the competitive community at large does care. 
Okay, so does the strong community mean that, I mean, does it translate to strong team performance? Or and like team presence, let's say, does Sweden have a lot of team tournaments that help you prepare for the event, or is it more solo or individual performance oriented? Wh which one of those is it? Because I, I I've seen Neil advertising. I can't remember the name of the of the tournament, but it happens at Easter, I think. Uh, that I think is a teams tournament, yeah, and he wanted to bring in uh, foreign players to that tournament as, or foreign teams to that tournament as well. But other than that, is it team oriented, solo oriented? Which which, which is which? Okay, uh, we have about. If you asked me three years ago, we would have a single team tournament every year in Sweden. Uh, but to this year, we would have had four or five. Mm -hmm. So I think Team 40K is on the rise in Sweden. Um, so yeah, we have, some singles have been converted to team tournaments and uh, some extra team tournaments has just popped up. So mm -hmm. uh, Teams is definitely more okay. coming out. And do you have, because, and I'm interested in that, I wanted to also consult this with, with the Polish uh, national team, but maybe I'll do this at the WTC. Um, but I, I'm i quite impressed with what people do in England in that they have local teams, like, I don't know, Team Ignite, Team Hivemind, Team uh, some... <laughs> I can't remember the full name. Something you can, mind you can just make some up. No one is going to I yeah. could, yeah, we're pretty much good. But Team Mind Goblins is one that I can think of. Uh, yeah. So, so, so definitely yeah, so, a real team. No, it is. No, they are a real team. They are oh, the dang. luckiest team in the UK scene. Exactly. It doesn't they sound are... real at all. But so, so I think they are notorious they are... for going to, to like those major team events and just doing like a slalom between the most difficult teams <laughs> and they somehow get to the top no, I'm, of, of course I'm, I'm joking but uh the, the uk has this they they do this there are a lot of local teams um that, that center around like a shop or, or some a circle around the shop or something like that uh so do you do this as well is this common in sweden and if not would you be looking into doing something like that organizing something like this in the future to even further enhance that team spirit thing I mean, there are definitely local teams, like but usually based across the local towns of Sweden. Like, there's a where I'm from is Westeros. We call our team Westeros right. because you know, yeah. <laughs> and then there is like a team in in the south of Sweden. There's a few teams in Stockholm. So yeah, there's definitely a, like a team connection uh, mm -hmm. where you can play into that rivalry if you want, uh, which we like to do in Westeros because there was was a year when every single tournament was won by us, and then uh, you can, yeah. So it, it, it depends how strong uh, your team connection is, I would say. Mm -hmm. All right. Nathan, did you want to go next, or can I shoot with my questions? <laughs> oh, I mean, you can go first, and then I'll ask a hard question after this next question. I mean, okay, so, so <laughs> moving slowly or moving back to, like, the WTC topic, uh, I think Sweden's best performance ever was second place. If that's, if I'm not mistaken. Incorrect. I'm... Incorrect or correct? <laughs> Sweden has won the WTC, and uh, not the WTC, the ETC. The ETC, right. Okay, okay. Sweden has won. So we, ha yeah. so we are actually t talking to the winning team, but I see in the history, <laughs> yes. no, give me a sec. I'm... I can't are, you, are you stealing my question, Tomek? That's why I asked. <laughs> uh, fine, then I'm going to ask the question. Fair enough. Okay, you go ahead. <laughs> so, because I have it. this question, courtesy actually of somebody who helped me out with finding a good bank of questions. So, what we've seen is that Sweden has transitioned from traditionally one of the top contenders from ETC days to kind of a decent but not top team in the most recent few, mm -hmm. with the third place and then. Re more recently, we're talking about 7th place last year, 11th place, 13th place in the last three. Does the historical placing of the team have any weight on the current roster? And have there been any major contributing factors to changes in the roster to try to kind of get back to winning the ETC slash WTC now? Like trying to grow local competition, trying to grow more homegrown talent, or 
have there been challenges that have had the team kind of struggle a little bit recently with those things? There has definitely been like more of a, there are more new people on the team every year, I think. And I think that, the, like I was talking about, the, the rise of the average player, like the mm -hmm. average skill level in, in WC, because I am a newer player. I have played one year on the WC team. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely contributes to, I, I would say we have the strongest team we've ever had this year. Uh, but I also think that's true for most nations. So it, it, it's hard because it's hard to gauge against the rest of the world, uh, I would say. Okay. Do you think there are the, anything? The, are you making? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, the goal is definitely to get back to that uh, top three performing team uh, status, I would say. Okay. Are you guys putting anything new into place this year compared to previous years to kind of get back to that point? Or have you made those changes last year because you did go up to seventh and those changes are now starting to kind of see success? Um, it's a hard question to say. I don't actually know. I think it's just... Um... I think it's we have been like last year we were a lot better at embracing TTS and embracing that whole uh, practice. So I think last year we were more practiced than we've ever been, and this year we are even more practiced than that. So I think that's for sure is one of those things that that does add up to to more success. Okay. And then you said you have one of the youngest teams. Is that like? Are these a bunch of newer uh, players no, no, to 40k? No. Or not young, but like less experienced WTC team, rather, I should say. From a yeah, WTC um, experience standpoint, rather, I should say. Yeah, I would say we have we have a lot of players that started maybe their journey in end of eight, start of ninth. Okay. Uh, so yeah, there is a new up and coming team with but it's also Lots of the like all the people that played a million WC. We have, for example, one player that did win the w the ETC back in in day when he was like eighteen or something. That has now <laughs> come back twelve years later or something like that. Yeah, that's amazing. That's, <laughs> return yeah, return to try to bring the team to glory, or does he play on the team every year? He played last year, but I but he has had a break in between. Okay. All right. So. The team is, let's say, fresh in experience and so on, and so are you as a captain. And I, I always yeah. try to ask as many questions as possible about captaincy because I find this extremely interesting uh, and also the most demanding, probably, of roles. Uh, again, speaking from Polish experience, seeing how, mu how many hours and how much preparation Typhus has put into preparing the team for the WTC last year, I was in awe because he like it was like a second job and we spoke a lot. He 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 was knackered after the before the event already. Then the event itself was really stressful and it, I guess in a positive way. And then afterwards I know that he he was literally crying when they, you know, didn't secure the first spot and so on. So he took it very emotionally. Uh but throughout <coughs> the event he has done a tremendous job in motivating the team, in uh, keeping the team focused, uh, making or doing everything possible to obviously score the highest. So how are you kitted out to, to do a similar job? How, what, I mean, have you, have you had any chance to, uh, you know, to test yourself in that role? Like to motivate your players when they are down or, you know, when there are hard matchups or something like this. How, I guess I'm trying to ask, how do you know that you are the right person to be the captain? Uh, tradition in Sweden has it that there is not a great fight for the captaincy. It is usually <laughs> one person that volunteers and they are picked. And that is because it is a 40 hour job on top of your 40 hour job. So, yeah, pretty much. Um, how do I know I'm the right person? I would say that uh, I know I have picked the right people 
And I think that knowing that you picked the right support staff and, and having picked the right players, I will know how to communicate with them. We have a good mix of veterans and new players who can, mm -hmm. can help each other in the harder matchups. And, and we have for sure instilled the, the, the point that losing in teams is not losing for the team. Mm -hmm. It's losing for the team rather than losing. Yeah. So, uh, I guess, yeah. So, no, I, I mean, I do not know for sure I am the best captain possible, but uh, I believe that the team is the best possible. Mm -hmm. And you have the last year as captain as well to sort of lean on his experience, I guess. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, and I was a wise captain last year, basically, so, so that's also mm -hmm. a thing. All right, so you get promoted from experience. last year, basically. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> volunteered. It sounds like more like a little. No, bit no, no. Promoted. Volunteer. Promoted. Okay. I don't know. It sounded like volunteer to sacrifice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thrown under the bus. You name it. He's like, oh man, we've got this new guy here, and he's great. He's he's gonna be a great captain, and then diving out the other direction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but not not that new, judging by what you're saying. And yeah, it seems yeah. like a ton of thought has gone into building the team uh it sounds very healthy from what how you are describing it mm -hmm. that you have this whole let's call it council or group of people to support you the the, the previous captain is also there which i, I find extremely uh important mm -hmm. to bring all that captaincy experience with with him so are there any matchups especially after last year uh having seen that firsthand uh are there any matchups that you are looking forward to any teams that you want to prove something to, perhaps, or any teams that you simply want to beat down to the ground and, you know, pummel them until their heads explode? <laughs> Basically. Sweden is a neutral nation and has always been neutral. We have no rivalries with any nation. Uh, now, uh, we, it is always important for us to beat the Finnish because that is uh, like a national rivalry. Mm -hmm. um, there we go. And we did beat them last year. Um, other than that, it's um, like we would love to have revenge against Australia, which we were very close to beating last year. I would love to have a game against Germany, which we did not have last year. It was a, mm -hmm. a stomp. So like stuff like that. Like I, I want to actually, I if I got a pick, I would like to play against the top nations and do like put up a fight win or draw mm -hmm. or whatever, but we will to actually have, have been make resistance or whatever. Okay. So I'm just glad saying. you picked a rival. So many other people are like, I don't want to pick a rival, but I'm glad that you picked the finish <laughs> that you want to yeah, finish sure. them off. I love that. <laughs> finish the finish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a terrible pun. Um, <laughs> God damn it. Um, yeah, is it even a pun when it's just the same word twice? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, kind of, <laughs> sort of. I don't control the English language. It's kind of just three languages stapled together and we call it one language. And... Yeah. So why don't we talk a little bit about 10th edition then? So mm. how has Team Sweden been adapting to the big changes in 10th edition? What are the team's thoughts on kind of like the army power situation in 10th and then how are you personally kind of feeling about 10th edition um uh, let's start how the team adapted to 10th edition um we have like i said we're doing tts scrims we are keeping a wide eye on the meta we are we have had one practice weekend and we have one more to come next weekend so uh it's just going through it and like I would say maybe the top armies are pretty certain what they are and then it's it's mm -hmm. finding those last fifth rate, fourth rate uh, and seeing how that matches up against what everyone else will pick for their fourth rate and just can they get points against the, the top armies um, what was the other questions? You you did a three-parter. So. <laughs> oh, I know. I just wanted to make it really complicated for you. Um, 
you don't have like secret death guard tech that you're coming with first do you you wouldn't be the first team to tell us that they have secret death guard tech that they're waiting to show the world that death guard are actually good uh well i mean they won a tournament didn't they so <laughs> oh that <laughs> wouldn't be secret that's... anymore would it <laughs> I, I think they came second technically <laughs> I love the yes, uh, maybe. <laughs> and then the that's how much question... of attention I paid to that card, okay? <laughs> and then the third question was, how do you personally feel about tenth edition so far? Okay, uh, like, yeah, we can talk about that. I think this harkens back to where I talked about earlier, where the skill level might have, where the where where the skill expression in forty k is, because um, a big critique of tenth edition as a is, as a whole is that it's not as skill intensive as ninth. That, that some of the skill has gone out of the game and and it's uh, very easy to play or too easy to play. And I think the skill expression simply moves somewhere else. Um, it, like it goes from the combat phase shenanigans to being better target priority or, or some such. Because no one can ever play a perfect game of, of Warhammer. It hasn't been done. And if someone tells this they played it, they, they don't know what they're talking about. So even a simpler game is not a solved game. Uh, so to be short, I enjoy 10th edition for what it is. So like it is still Warhammer and I still see a little ton of skill expression in it. Okay. Uh, and maybe the skill expression isn't that you beat Elder. Maybe it is that you take two points from them where you should have gotten one. Um, you should be happy with that learning experience i guess mm -hmm. i like that answer everybody's like yeah you just throw that one person under the bus against eldar take the 20 and then just move on to the next one i like that better philosophy of like you're yeah. trying to throw that army into pull just like one or maybe two points off of them i like that um and then i have a much easier question now a fun question even as it were does Is it birds no, it's not birds yet. Birds are the closing uh, question. Okay, nothing. Hold question. your horse. <laughs> that's, that's the highlight of the show. <laughs> um, does Daniel plan on allegedly jumping in any canals this year or bathing in any canals this year? And will any team members be allegedly joining him in his canal ex escapades? Well, it, it the question is not... Will Daniel bathe in a canal? The, the question is, will the captain bathe in a canal? Is the canal oh, bathing oh. connected to, to him or to the captain? And should the canal bathing be connected to every captain of every team that does not win the WC? <laughs> that is my question to you. Oh, are we are we going to try to start a bet where every team that doesn't win the WTC, their captain has to accidentally, allegedly bathe in the canal? I mean, I didn't say it, but you did, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still safer than getting a tattoo after a lost bet. Well, as long as the tattoo is not in the canal, I think it's okay. <laughs> Although, I hear that Anthony has an open invitation for anybody to challenge him to a tattoo bet from the WTC captain's group. So, you know, if you want to get a tattoo or don't want to get a tattoo, or you want to force Anthony to get a tattoo, <laughs> you can join that bet. I'm just saying. Come on. Right there. That man has a problem with bets, and I will not take advantage. <laughs> yeah, like gambling is not his strongest side, I guess. He's he's definitely told us on our previous episode that he's dedicated a leg basically just to WTC tattoo bets. So there's just one leg W yeah. that's dedicated to WTC bets. Yeah, I guess for him, a loss is not even a loss if he has a dedicated leg. So, uh, but Jonathan, no. uh, I mean, uh, he uh, wants uh, to get the tattoo. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, like, you know, he'll get in any sort of bet, I guess, sure. just to get it. Um, but a question uh, <laughs> from me that I wanted—I mean, I want to touch upon the topic of that espionage and so on, the the, the spying on other teams uh, that you mentioned. Uh, <laughs> part of that, I guess at least uh, listening to like previous year podcasts by people from Australia and from other teams, the Australians once said on a podcast that they are like, they made a mistake of entering with their teams lists into the Warmaster event uh, that is part of the WTC. 
because they had someone from mm. Team America just sit at their tables all the time observing what their <laughs> lists actually do. So <laughs> last year, they drew conclusions from that. They didn't make the same mistake, and they brought completely different lists to singles than they did to teams. Uh, apparently, or well, yeah. from, from what we can tell, it paid off. Um, are your guys going to play in the War Masters event, and do you also plan on some sort of secrecy shenanigans with that, or not really? Um, we have some people playing the War Masters. We basically, what we've said is, if we have a secret tech list, then we would probably not want them to play that in War Masters. But also, I think those secret tech lists might not be suited for War Masters. So mm -hmm. playing something else there shouldn't be a big sacrifice. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. But if but if what you put into War Masters is a triple rate knight, then <laughs> what are people gonna learn? Mm -hmm. And I know that, that we're jumping around topics a little bit, but I wanted to come back to the topic of captaincy as well. Do you think that because of 10th edition, your job as a captain is going to be more difficult than, than it was last year, for example, in, at the end of, or like, at, you know, at the height of 9th? So uh, the, the edition has maybe some somewhat more randomness about it. Uh, missions and cards make the games maybe a little bit more difficult to predict. Uh, or not really? Like, what is your observation so far? And do you think that your players will be able to give you reliable information from their games when you, you know, walk around, let's say, the tables and try to figure out what is the final score that your team is going to bring? Um, yeah, I, I think there will be an impact of that. Maybe not because it's more random, but just because we haven't had as much time to learn the matchups. Like you would have had if we say we played ninth at this WTC, then I would be pretty sure about all the matchups. And now uh, it's it's harder to know. So yeah, you're gonna have more unreliable information, but I think that's just something you have to factor in, like mm -hmm. update it more often and um, uh, be more be faster to to respond if uh, a matchup doesn't go as you thought it would. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think, this is still in the spirit of talking about 10th edition, do you think that, uh, because WTC released it, its own terrain pack, uh, but I guess, at least from our, like, here in the north of Poland, our local community is currently having a discussion whether we should be following the WTC uh, rulings about terrain, or should we try and stick to GW's original terrain layouts and so on? Uh, what do you think of WTC's terrain layouts and do you see them being created in the future or is actually GW now doing a great job of creating terrain layouts for tournaments? Sorry, my, uh, that, uh, it, it broke down. I did not. Oop. Oop. And lost <laughs> we lost, we lost him completely. Yeah. Hopefully he'll That's come back. Yep. If not, I'll just ask you bird related questions until he gets back. Just <laughs> that's fine. We'll just start every minute until he gets back. I'll ask a bird related question. Mm. The first I'll one just... is Yeah, go on. Would you eat puffin? Uh why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I uh if it's well prepared, well seasoned, well served, why not? I would eat anything that is well well, oh, well served. And I love back. that. That's that's my favorite answer to any question. I won't lie. Yeah. Also, I... welcome back. So, what happened? Did your battery die, or uh, is it your headset that died? What what happened? He's muted. He's muted. Jonathan, I think you're muted. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so, so now we get to have bird question number two. <laughs> I'm so, uh, uh, let me ask you a question. I don't know if you've heard sure. about it. There, there was a show, a mm -hmm. very good show. Uh, I can't remember who made it. Uh, I believe David Attenborough was reading for it. It was called uh, Human Planet. Yeah. And and essentially, in that show, uh, they like each episode was about a different sort of. Uh, climate 
or area that people were able to inhabit <laughs> and adjust to it. So it went from Arctica to oceans to jungles to blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And in one episode, it's still bird related. Uh, they <laughs> went to like Arctic, Arctica or, or, or Antarctica, yeah. Antarctica. And they had um, uh, some Eskimo guys interviewed. And mm -hmm. uh, the Eskimos show them like a local tradition that was preparation of something called kivyak. And now kivyak is essentially a dish where they catch those little, I don't know, puffins or, or small birds. Mm -hmm. They twist their, their necks and then they stuff them inside like a, a, a hollowed seal skin. So they stuff those birds inside <laughs> as many as possible. <laughs> then they close this this whole knit it closed mm -hmm. uh, so so you know so no air gets in they put seal grease on it so so that it's like sealed um, and waterproof sealed yeah. and, and waterproof and then they put it underground in rocks for a year and yeah. then it ferments underground and so on and so on and af after a year i think for someone's birthday or something like that they remove it from underground they open it and they like share it like it, chips yeah. uh, would you eat that <laughs> That's my question. To yes. You. So if somebody offered it to me, like in that fashion, like I would eat it. I'm not going to go out and seek some of these things. But if somebody is like coming up to me and it's like, you should try this. Like, this is a delicacy. I will try <laughs> it. Like, it would be rude to not do it. So can you I'll do it. Hear me? Yes. Yeah, we, we can, can hear you. you. We, we were just uh, killing time with yeah, no, <laughs> well, questions. Well, well, <laughs> We can hear you. We were just figuring out if your internet was stable enough, so we were talking about birds because that's the yeah, theme for this I, show. I think uh, I don't know. I think that the pair of earphones I had uh, distorted your audio too much. I, I mm -hmm. m most of this uh, show, by the way, I have heard the very last of all questions and not oh, heard no. the middle at all. So, <laughs> but I think so I did a good job. So you've done an amazing job of guessing what we're yeah. trying to, <laughs> to talk Love about. It. But what I have surmised with the human interaction now is that you only need to listen to the last three words to understand the question, and the rest is probably irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, especially with me, where my, my questions are tangents of their own, so yeah. Man, this, it this makes much more stable now, so I think maybe the, the headset I was using was actually interfering a bit with the connection. Fair okay. enough. That makes so many more of the things where I was asking three questions now seem so much more terrible. Because <laughs> mm. I was like, man, he just doesn't want to answer that middle question, does he? And then he <laughs> now it makes hear? more yeah. sense. <laughs> um, right. So I guess we'll, we'll just, where were we? 10th edition, right? That's right. So the 10th edition and the randomness of it, I think, uh, was one of yeah, the questions. Yeah, no, I think you, you started with a, a terrain question? or was Oh, it... yeah, sorry. So, yeah. yeah. That, so another question that I wanted to ask uh, pertains to the WTC terrain. Uh, recently, uh, a, a terrain pack has been released. Uh, again, is that enough time to properly trial and test it? And then the second question to build on top of that is, do you think we will need that in the future? Or is GW actually doing a good job designing their own terrain layouts now? Um, if you want a game that has light, medium, and heavy tables, I don't think GW will ever intentionally do that. So I think we will always need the terrain pack. Uh, I also think that sometimes GW like they underestimate how powerful towering is and then we need mm -hmm. to adjust for that. And I do think that there will always be a need for, for different terrain at the WTC, even if we can, I, I, I think it's a good thing that we approach the GW style, uh, like the Perspex basis, Perspex, whatever. Um, and that uh, that's good, but I, yeah, I think GW maps at the base has problems that need to be addressed for teams. Mm -hmm. And and since you have differing levels of experience with kind of the length of that people have been playing 40k, how are you getting some of the newer people to adapt to like the new decks that you're drawing from and stuff like that? Because not everybody played the old format where you drew mission cards and that, that name of which just ran right out of my brain. Um, Tempest of War, uh, there we go. It was Maelstrom <laughs> of War and then Maelstrom, there was Tempest there you go. of War. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
I think most people have an, a background in, say, Magic the Gathering or other board games where you draw cards and, and you get a, a random objective or something you need to perform. And also, the, the, the is, this edition's cards are not that hard. Like, mm -hmm. One of them yeah. is engage on all fronts. And if you are positioned properly on the board, you can probably get that one. And if you're not, then it's still not the end of the world. So I don't think this deck is that punishing. Uh, for not knowing it, but it is quite rewarding for positioning to um, to uh, take advantage of what cards you have left. So I think a big part is realizing what cards are left in your deck, and that's something we've been discussing a lot. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So according to your observation, has have the games become shorter? Like I know for a fact that there there was a ruling that the games at the WTC are supposed to, I mean, they, they will be allowed to last up to four and a half hours. Have you actually played a game that was that long? Uh, this is this is hard question, because like a tournament game is not the same as a testing game. Absolutely. So I have definitely played four and a half hour games where mm -hmm. you maybe, you, you could maybe rewind a turn or two just to see like, test out a different approach. Yeah. Uh, but I think no tournament game of 10th would take more than three hours. And if it, depending on how broken armies it evolves, it, it can go much faster than that. Hmm. I think this edition will play faster when, once we get used to it. But there's also a, uh, some uh, of not knowing everything at the start. So it, it takes a bit longer now than it, it will at, at the mm -hmm. end of 10th edition. OK. And then to rewind in a confusing way, hmm. unless Tomek, you had a follow-up question to that answer before I answer, ask another question. Well, not to this one in particular. I just okay. have a bunch of other questions, so go ahead. So for practice, are you, so there is a philosophy that we were introduced to by Rude um, for his practice games where he, during practice, and I kind of like this, I think this is great. And so I'm wondering how you, if you also use this approach, Rude uses this approach during team practice where he'll walk over to some people rolling dice and he'll say, no, you fail all of those and then walk away. Do you give your players scenarios and force failures and force them to try out different things during team practice? Will you just walk over and be like, no, you fail five of those saves. What are you going to do? Or you um, make that 12 inch charge. Now, what are you going to do? Nothing, no, never not something that extreme. I think the, the, the worst part of that is like you go first this matchup, or you didn't get the tray, you didn't get the table pick, so you were playing on this table now, or uh, stuff like that. And then, because I, you ha don't have enough time to get the right amount of testing into a normal game and not weird game uh, to get uh, accurate data. So I think those games where something random happens could be useful if we had more time. Say if we had a year to test this edition, then the last three months maybe should be that type of game. But I think for the short time we have, we need to play the most likely games uh, where not something random happens. I, I think like that, that is more valuable testing. I like that answer. I'm going to I'm gonna tell Rude all about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, I mean, <laughs> let's just say Rude might really like making his players suffer, and that's You're making that's them feel miserable. <laughs> <laughs> that's a kink that he has. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shame We're him no, for it. it. No kink shaming on contact law stat check. Contact. Never no. ever. <laughs> Kinks and rants are very welcome here. Um, so, Jonathan, I I wanted to ask about something, and this is the relation to what you said. Uh, and in a way to what Anthony Vanella said in the previous episode. No, it's nothing like crazy. But you said <laughs> um, that, uh, I think in your judgment of 10th edition, you said that essentially the skill gravitas in this edition has might have shifted to a different place. So maybe it's not in combat, but somewhere else, like positioning or whatever. Mm. Last episode, Anthony said, or I think he even went further in in his critique and he said that he believes that at the end of the event at the end of wtc uh even though we have a victor we won't be able to clearly say who the best team skill wise is 
do you agree with that? Do you agree that you know taking all everything about tenth edition into account, the 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 time for preparation, uh, the uh, variab variance variability, the, <laughs> the randomness of the game, uh, and so on, that Anthony is right, or would you say you are on the completely other end of the spectrum? Not completely other end of the spectrum. I would say that at the end of WC, we will most likely have the best team at the event finish first. Okay. Like, there is always a small like margin. And, and to be clear, when we poke skill in teams, uh, it is not the eight most skilled Warhammer players that is the best skilled team. Like, I wouldn't say that last year Australia had the eight best, like, summed up skill level players. I won the event. There were like other areas that matter, like the lists, the pairings, the being used to the heat. I don't know. <laughs> like, Adaptabil adaptability in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so, no, I would say that at the end of WC, we will have 95, I would be 95% sure that that is the best team standing up there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I guess that's what going to be one of the final questions for me, and then we can move to the fun questions uh, from yeah. from Nathan. But um, <laughs> let's say that you know you said again that your team, that Sweden, is uh, doesn't have any enemies, it doesn't have any rivals, or maybe Finland, but other than that, not really. Uh, so, which team would you be rooting for the most? if let's say Sweden was not playing, because obviously you'll say Sweden, but if not Sweden, then who, according to you? Well, anyone but England, right? Oh, I love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love how yeah, the world uh... is unified in this situation. <laughs> this is the true unifier of everyone. Going no, to I, the WTC. I, if, I have a bet that uh, will get me a beer that uh, if, uh, America finishes top three, so so a bit there, but um, win the event. Um, I don't think I have a good pick here, honestly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, anyone but England, I think will yeah, resonate. I think with that will many. that will have, that will be fine. <laughs> yeah, and imagine the backlash if um, if England actually wins. I, I think people will call for like redoing the event or something because. <laughs> It's just so bad now. We're gonna uh, exile them. Actually, they're just gonna be exiled completely. They from the they have they exiled ex themselves from the European Union. That's what I wanted so to say. Just <laughs> like... They're good at doing that to themselves. We don't need to help them anymore. Oh man, are we gonna? Are, do you want me to ask bird related questions now? Because I'm sure everybody's real. It it's not a. That's why people people watch the show for the bird related <laughs> questions. Let's face it. The rest is is filler until you get there. I mean, that's what we're not paying you for, right? So go on. Uh, man, nobody pays me anything for anything. Um, <laughs> so first, we're going to talk about pigeons, because pigeons are everybody's favorite bird. Definitely. Definitely 100%. Who wins in a fight? A pigeon from Stockholm or a pigeon from New York? How many rounds? <laughs> we'll give you three Endurance. rounds. It'll be a best of three. The thing is that no one is going to win the first fight in the first round. And the American pigeon will not be patched up because he can't afford it. <laughs> so the Swedish pigeon will be patched up, ready to go for three rounds, and thus wins the fight. Man, I love how everybody's answers to this question either revolve around the pigeon being like a horrific mutant or just something else that's politically wrong with the United States. But, I love yeah. it. It's, it's you know, where's Obamacare when it's needed? It's true. Yeah. And then the second bird related question, just because I want to make this rivalry even deeper, is who wins in a fight? A pigeon from Stockholm or a, fig a pigeon from Helsinki? A pigeon from Helsinki has a knife. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Oh boy. 100%. So yeah, and I, then, I'm not betting against that. And then is there a bird that can beat a Canadian goose in combat? The most fearsome bird I've ever witnessed was when I was in Australia and it was seagull mating season. And there was literally seagulls falling out of the sky because they were attacking each other and killing each other. So I think the Australian seagull is the most fearsome bird. <laughs> 
but specifically during mating season. So we got to have yeah, a really yeah. strict time frame for yeah, this occurrence. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I think so. I think I'll, that's all of my bird related questions. Yeah, I, I, I'll, 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 add, I'll add one uh, bird related question, and if uh, you know, let, let's see where it goes because I I don't have experience with a lot of bird questions, but. <laughs> If a Swedish pigeon was to create a music band, what type of music would it be, and why heavy metal? <laughs> uh, heavy metal pigeon. Oh, we just created a new kind of bird. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where to take this. I feel okay. like after the show, after the show, the pigeon is going to be this heavy metal pigeon is going to be Sweden's new logo, like on their. I guess. I guess the heavy metal pigeon would go on stage and bite the head of Ozzy Osbourne. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, Revenge. Yeah. yeah. I will note that that was a bat. <laughs> yeah, a sure. Pigeon, but that, sure. Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the best answer we could we could count for. So yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so Jonathan, is there anything? that you perhaps want to plug or, or anything that you should you would like to make us aware of like are there any swedish podcasts or any international tournaments that you would like uh people to come to or anything of that sort now is the time to do it to make us aware oh god i don't have the dates of any of these <laughs> <laughs> no 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 but you, you know just yeah. you can you can just mention the name and people will google yeah. it or something but we is have... there anything yeah there are several Swedish majors every year. Um, like literally, we probably have a tournament a, a month, uh, all spread across Sweden. Easy flights to Westeros from um, uh, England. Uh, easy drives to to the start of Sweden from Denmark and Germany and Netherlands. So, if you're interested in coming to play a, a tournament in Sweden, then just hit us up or hit up the. Uh, Swedish 40k on uh, Facebook and we'll get you in touch. Cool. We never touched upon this, but uh, I guess Swed Swedish tournaments uh, from all the tournaments that happen, they do count towards ITC, right? Or something like that, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's something that, for example, Poland cannot really boast because we never, we never did uh, um, the ITC. But I guess in Sweden, that's something that might actually bring people in, right? To want to... to to, to score some points. There are some majors to win that can grant them <laughs> ITC points. Yeah, for sure. Um, the ITC is a dying system in, in a lot of ways. So, but, <laughs> but yeah, for sure. But if, but if you want to keep it alive and do come to Sweden, I guess that's yeah, how we can... Will, if we keep it alive, though, is that the... I, I love that, that the... The shots fired on this episode are mostly at the ITC at the end of the episode. No, but but now I need to ask, uh, why do you think so? Like again, I know very little about the ITC apart from the fact that it exists. That like the the the, the English, for example, play towards it and like to see their placing in it. Why do you think it's dying? That depends on what you want to see the ITC. If the, if you believe that the ITC is to pick the best player in the world every year, that is not what it does. It simply picks a person in America or England to win it. <laughs> it doesn't show you the best player. Uh, something like StatCheck might show you the best player, but um, <laughs> well but also it, it's it's wow. very hard to <laughs> to pick this. And I think any farm ranking system that doesn't have an yellow um, Yellow, elo, mm -hmm. elo yeah. rating is just fundamentally flawed. Uh, if it doesn't matter who you play against, if it only matters how big the event is, it is not a very good ranking system. This is my favorite answer to this question so far because it's just my answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good well, system to get people to play lots of tournaments during a time where we did not have a better choice. But yes, it is time. All right. It is time right. for the the ITC to be used as the foundation for a new system built on top yeah. of it. Maybe run by GW, maybe not. But like, there needs to be. I think the end, if you want, in the end, if you want the ranking system that everyone uses, it needs to be run by GW. How okay. feasible that is, I don't know. But... Okay. 
that's an interesting take and an interesting way to finish the episode. But if you still want to score some points in this dying system, head on to Sweden. <laughs> yes, that's what I can say <laughs> to, to, to top it off. Nathan, any, any final words, final comments from you? All I want to say is that I just want somehow to find out if there's a tourism department in Sweden and if they have, like, a motto that we can put right here. Like, just at the end of the episode. Oh, God. I don't know this. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to pronounce it, so... <laughs> <laughs> you could literally just say anything in Swedish and we would just believe you that that was yeah. what it yeah, was. Yeah, I'm much. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I have nothing have else. Hmm? All right. Oh, I guess goodbye. Oh, yeah. yeah, before I allow you to say goodbye. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, just one more thing. I mean, to all our listeners, if you like what we do, uh, please let the world know about it. So let the world know about it either by uh, leaving a like, subscribing. I think we are about to hit 600 subscribers, so help us reach that number. Uh, also tell a friend, simply, that there is contact loss, that they do what they do, and if you like it, yeah, uh, let them know about it. Uh, we're not asking you to write reviews because I know that it's painful and uh, you know people don't really like to do that. But if you could give us a thumbs up or something like this um, in any of the uh, media outlets, that would be much, much appreciated. And then hit the bell button as well because uh, our channel on YouTube is probably going to be one of the places where the uh, WTC studio uh, material goes uh, both live and afterwards so if you want to, to to stay up to date with this or if you want to have easy access to this then that's one of the ways of of actually doing it so uh yeah please help us grow and we will repay you with uh, quality content like this one and some more bird related topics um, <laughs> <laughs> and now is the time thank you everyone thank you jonathan for joining us and for being open about all those uh things that we tried to squeeze out from you and uh to our listeners and everyone else until next time bye bye bye, -bye. bye.